Morant with a running start. Elevate. Oh, oh, it does. Oh, oh, my goodness. Oh. He's done. High game in overtime. Gasol will turn. into it on the floor with Randolph. Hard to tell if there are any punches being thrown under there, but Griffin took except Adams going long. Moran! Oh, he hit it! He hit it! He hit it! John Moran gets 70! You gotta be kidding me. Welcome to Grits and Grinds, a Memphis Grizzlies podcast. Grizzlies win! Edition. The Grizzlies blew out the Milwaukee Bucks to close out their homestand two and two. Ja Morant came up huge with the triple-double, and the Grizzlies got a much-needed victory, a dominant blowout win over the Bucks. On today's episode, we will talk about that game, and also the Grizzlies declined the fourth-year option for Jake LaRavia, which is an intriguing decision. So... I also have to talk about that. Before we get there, just a reminder, if you want to get bonus content from me and if you want to join my Grizzlies fan Slack channel, you can do that at patreon.com slash fastbreakbreakfast. I give maybe some blunter opinions in that Slack channel than what I release on these episodes. So if you want that, patreon.com slash fastbreakbreakfast. Oh, by the way, October's bonus episode, it's coming out this weekend. Halloween week filled up pretty quickly for me. But anyways, uh, get some bonus content. Support the show, patreon.com slash fastbreakbreakfast. All right, this is exactly what the Grizzlies needed. After losing some painful games against the Bulls and the Nets, the Grizzlies bounced back in a huge way, despite being very shorthanded. Ja Morant posted the 12th Triple-double of his career. He nearly got it in the first half. He finished the game with 26 points, 14 assists, and 10 rebounds. At halftime, he had 21, 9, and 8. It was an unbelievable performance from Ja, and the team got off to a fast start. They had a 40-point first quarter. That's their highest-scoring quarter of the season. They used a 14-0 run in that first quarter to build up the lead. They scored 70 points in the first half, and then in the third quarter, they built the lead up to 31 points. That's their largest lead that they've held all season and end up winning the game comfortably to the point where they cleared the bench. The minutes were very, very low, not because of an 11-man rotation where you were purposely deflating the minutes of your starters, the minutes were very low because you won by a lot. I prefer that. So the story of this game beyond John Morant's triple-double, beyond the big blowout, is the fact that the Grizzlies were missing so many players. Desmond Bain, who suffered an oblique injury against the Nets, he was out. Marcus Smart, who twisted his ankle, he was out. Of course, Vince Williams Jr., Gigi Jackson, Luke Kennard, those guys are all out. So you were really shorthanded. That's basically half of your expected rotation for this season not available for this game. Now, I'm recording this on Friday morning, November 1st. I'm a little bit worried later today we're going to get some injury updates for all the guys. I wouldn't be surprised if they release this injury update later Friday, early evening, or late afternoon. And my concerns are it's going to be bad news for everybody. Bad news for Vince Williams Jr. He's not on the precipice of a return. Bad news for Desmond Bain. I mean, I don't know what to expect for that injury. Jeff Stotts, the in-street clothes social media guy who does injury projections just based on the average time missed based on previous similar injuries. He said normally in the NBA, an oblique injury means a guy misses about four games or 11 days. Now, Paolo Bencaro just got announced as having a torn oblique muscle is going to be out for four to six weeks, or it's going to be four to six weeks before he's re-evaluated. So hopefully it's not that serious of an injury, but I am nervous. It could be like two to four weeks for Desmond Bain. I had, have no idea what to expect for Marcus Smart. Hopefully it's just a couple of days, but you know Marcus Smart has a history of some injury problems. So I'm nervous about what the injury update is going to say. 
But in this game, they at least survived it, not having all of those guys available, and they did it because of John Morant. Also, Jalen Wells gets his first career start, ends up playing 36 minutes. Jalen, new career high, 16 points, also got seven rebounds, one assist. He made three out of six three-pointers. The game, I mean, maybe it was fortuitous the way it started, and you thought it was going to be a good night, because John Morant had an early play where he tried an alley-oop for Santi Aldama. It was way too high. It slammed off the backboard, but it came right to Zach Eady. Zach Eady caught it and finished a dunk. Then right after that, one of Jaw's first baskets was kind of his patented move where he fakes the defender out, where he, he does a pick and roll. It was a pick and roll with Zach Eady. And by the way, Zach Eady got involved in so many pick and rolls this game. But it was a pick and roll with Zach Eady, where then Brooke Lopez switches on to John ja Morant. John ja Morant does his patented move that he does a lot of times. This led to those huge dunks, those famous dunks, the one against Jalen Smith on the Pacers, the one against the Suns back in the day. It's the same move, but it got him open for a little floater, so he scored quickly there. And that just got the Grizzlies off. It felt like on the right foot. And in the second quarter, he strung together... An unbelievable stretch that kicked off with that spectacular play where he threw an alley-oop to Santi Aldama while he was sitting on the ground. The seated alley-oop pass. And if that wasn't good enough, he follows it up with a three-pointer where he does a big ball fake. Then he hits a leaning banker. He threw a pass ahead to Santi Aldama for a dunk. This is all in succession. Then the next possession, he hits this turnaround 17-footer over Torian Prince. And like Ja had it all going on. And maybe you say Ja knew more was going to be expected of him this game. Maybe it was the frustration over the Bulls and the Nets game. Maybe it was the increased minutes. After the game against the Nets, and I didn't have this information when I recorded the last episode. For whatever reason, it wasn't included in the post-game media information they sent out. But John Morant did express some frustration about that Nets game and sort of about the minutes, the low minutes. DeMichael Cole asked him, you know, do they tell you you're going to have low minutes before the game? What do you think about the minutes? And Ja's response was, live with it. And he kept saying, live with it. When asked about the situation, he also expressed some frustration when, um, or about people on Twitter. Grizzlies fans on Twitter are complaining about guys missing games and inferring that guys are soft. And he said something like, oh, you guys want me to play tomorrow night's game as well? Okay, I will. And of course, that comes across as, well, yes, obviously, we want you to play every game. You're our best player. It would be amazing if you could play every, every game. So I don't know if it's this added motivation that John Morant puts on himself, but the result is amazing. You get one of his best games of his career. You get a highlight package that rivals, I mean, any player ever. It was sort of reminiscent of a Pistons game from two years ago where John Morant had something like eight plays that could have been in the Sports Center top 10 highlights of the night. He had so many ridiculous passes in this game, so many ridiculous shots. Chris Harrington tracked that eight of Jaws' 14 assists were alley oops for dunks. I mean, throwing eight alley oops for dunks in one game is exceptional. So maybe it was the added motivation. And again, maybe it was the extra minutes. And as we keep talking about the Grizzlies rotation and their 11-man rotation they used in most games so far, or in every game uh, before this one, in this game, basically only 11 guys available, but you knew they weren't going to play them. Like, that's counting Colin Castleton, which, by the way, the Grizzlies signed to their vacated two-way spot. He's a big man. From Florida, he was a Lakers two-way guy last year. He's supposedly a big man with some shooting chops, with some passing chops. Feels like the normal type of prototype player, big for the modern NBA. Maybe the guy, a type of center that the Grizzlies could use. Someone like Jay Huff, who they already got. So they have Colin Castleton. He was one of the available guys. Yuki Kawamura, one of the available guys. So you knew they weren't probably going to play all those guys in the first half, and they didn't. They shortened the rotation. Nine-man rotation. And the results speak for themselves, I think. Now, maybe you're not going to make a direct correlation to the Grizzlies playing a shorter rotation and having a better result. 
We're not going to be that reckless. But I think it's fair to point out that, like, hey, Ja Morant, he played 17 minutes in the first half. 17 minutes, otherwise known as normal minutes for a starter. Santi Aldama played 18 minutes in the first half. Jaron's minutes were still low, but they staggered Ja Morant and Jaron Jackson Jr.'s minutes. Either Ja or Jaron were on the court for every minute of the game until they emptied the bench. That, to me, feels like basic things that you could do to increase your odds of winning basketball games. Like, I think most NBA players, if they're good, you play them 17 minutes in the first half, you play them 17 minutes in the second half, maybe 20 minutes if it's an important game. And then if you're winning or if you're getting blown out, they end up playing fewer minutes. So, like, 17 minutes in the first half sets you up for a guy playing, you know, 32, 34 minutes for the game or 37 minutes if it's a very important close game. And, like, those are regular NBA minutes. And now maybe they're trying to reinvent the wheel by keeping everybody's minutes so low. But you look at this game and you're like, hey, we played a normal rotation. Worked out pretty good. John Morant played pretty good. What if we do that more often? But we will see what happens after that. So Jaron in this game, 13 points, five rebounds, two assists. Didn't need to do much because everything else was clicking, like the bench. Everybody had a great game. Scottie Pippen Jr., I mean, honestly, was amazing in this game. Had 16 points, three rebounds, an assist, and a steal. Uh, Jake LaRavia, who we'll get to in a bit, Jake LaRavia bounced back from his 1-for-10 game against the Nets. He had 11 points, 10 rebounds, three assists, two steals. Brandon Clark did not play very many minutes. If the game, I think, was closer, he might have ended up playing more. But Brandon Clark, for the second straight game, makes all of his field goal attempts. So that's eight straight made field goals for Brandon Clark. Also, he hit some floaters that were further away from the basket. That's the Brandon Clark we know and love. The Brandon and Jaron minutes, still dominant. They won them in this game as well. The Ja Morant, Brandon Clark minutes, the numbers look amazing. So I love that. And it's not just the numbers. I mean, the eye test, it's amazing. The numbers merely reflect what happened. So that part has been very promising that Brandon Clark is looking better. Jay Huff only made one out of four of his field goal attempts, had four points and two rebounds. And Zach Eady. So Zach Eady, I was happy to see, got a lot of playing time in this one, at least compared to other games. Finishes with 24 minutes of playing time. Had 10 points and eight rebounds, a steal and a block. And I really... I thought it was important to give Zach Eady more minutes. One of the good benefits of this shorthanded rotation is you're going to be forced to play Zach Eady. And his defense has not been ideal. He still gets the ball stripped from him a lot. He brings the ball low down in the paint, and guards and forwards are taking the ball away from him. I wish he was more dominant with the ball. I wish he was a more dominant rebounder. But he looked good in this game. And also, I think that they gave him opportunities to do things he's good at, which is screening. In the third quarter, they ran Ja Morant, Zach Eady pick and rolls over and over and over. Zach was credited with three screen assists in this game. He leads the Grizzlies in screen assists for the season by a mile. He has nine. He, by the way, is top 20 in the NBA in post-ups per game. 2.7 post-ups per game in his limited minutes. But like you just saw plays, I don't know what the play's called, or what the screen is called, but it's like a play where he screens Brook Lopez twice. He comes up top of the keys, sets the screen for Ja Morant. Then when he's rolling towards the basket, he ends up screening Brook Lopez again. Like, Ja missed the shot, but that's the kind of thing that's a strength of Zach Eady, and I was happy to see them leaning into that, playing into Zach's strengths. So then I think he has a chance maybe to build his confidence and, and keep improving. And also, by the way, uh, I mean, he made some highlight plays beyond finishing some of Ja's alley-oop passes he had a couple he also had a great block of Damian Lillard early in the game that led to a Jalen Wells jumper again maybe that was a good omen for how this game was going to go now the Grizzlies get the win and now their schedule relaxes a little bit this was the end of these six games in nine nights now they go on the road for a couple of winnable games they play on Saturday against the 76ers. 
I don't think Joel Embiid or Paul George are expected to be available for that game. Then they have a revenge game against the Nets on Monday. Then you come home for some important home games. You play the Lakers on Wednesday, November 6th. Then you play the Wizards on Friday, November 8th. By the way, for that Wizards game, Friday, November 8th, that's the next Grizzlies watch party in Nashville. So make plans to hang out with me and other Grizzlies fans at Nobles Beer Hall in Nashville, Tennessee. Again, Friday, November 8th, a week from today, come to Nobles Beer Hall, win some Grizzlies prizes that I'm giving out, have a good time over there. Um, one important stat for the victory over the Bucks. The Grizzlies had 68 points in the paint. They didn't make many three-pointers again. Second straight game, only making eight three-pointers. But when you get 68 points in the paint, it doesn't matter. And now the Grizzlies remain one of the best points in the paint teams on the season. In the last three games, 68 points in the paint, 60 points in the paint, 70 points in the paint. That is how it should work. Now, only one and two over those three games. But ideally, you wouldn't turn the basketball over like he did against the Nets. In this game, you took care of the basketball, uh, despite John Morant trying an alley-oop off the glass to Zach Eady. You basically took care of the basketball. You're scoring in the paint. And when you do that, a lot of times you can endure nights where the three-point shot doesn't go in for everybody. Now, um, let's take a break, and then we'll come back and go over the somewhat surprising decision for the Grizzlies where they declined Jake LaRavia's fourth-year option. All right, the deadline for teams to decide on the fourth-year team options for their guys on rookie contracts was Halloween. And the Grizzlies took this decision down to the deadline. They were the final team to make a call on their player. I'm not sure what they were waiting for. It definitely added an element of suspense. And they ended up saying no thank you to paying Jake LaRavia $5 million for the 2025-2026 season. I call this decision slightly odd because it's not very often that you turn down a fourth-year option on a guy that you're pretty sure is going to still be in the NBA. Beyond that, I feel really confident that Jake LaRavia is going to sign a second contract in the NBA. So now that means Jake LaRavia will be an unrestricted free agent next offseason. Declining your fourth-year options on guys who are usable rotation players normally only happens when, like, maybe it's a James Wiseman and their fourth-year team option is a bunch of money. I can't remember what James Wiseman's fourth-year option was. It was like $13 million or something like that. You can understand, all right, that's not his market value. If we want James Wiseman, we can sign him for less than that. $5.2 million is a starting salary for a 23-year-old six foot seven wing, which is what Jake will be next summer. Not very much. That's less than you're paying John Conchar. If Jake LaRavia continues playing like he's played this season, which I think is pretty good, despite that one for 10 game against the Nets, he's going to be worth more than that. If Jake LaRavia plays well, some other team is going to offer him more than $5 million. Drew Hill reported, I mean, this is not a quote, but obviously this is something we can infer. Drew Hill says, per sources, the Grizzlies are encouraged by Jake LaRavia's development and remain interested in retaining him beyond this season, but to maintain flexibility for a roster with several young wings and 12 players already under contract for 25-26, they won't be picking up his team option. All right, that is a little bit of hogwash, I believe is the correct technical term. If they're interested in retaining his services beyond this season, they would have picked up his option. If he plays well enough to keep him, you're going to want him for that salary. If 
he doesn't play well enough where you're like, I don't think he's worth $6 million a year. Well, then obviously you're not going to keep him. Does that make sense? If he's worth the money, obviously you want him, but you decided not to have him. If he's not worth the money, well, then why do I want him back? I don't want him back at all. Like if he's a minimum player going forward, fine, no big deal. And certainly many people think he's, he's a minimum guy and he's not worth it. I think he's proven more than that. And I think he still has a ways to go developmentally. He still only played 75 total NBA games. This season, and this is what makes it, I think, more quizzical to me. This season, Jake LaRavia is second on the team in minutes. You're playing him a lot. And of course, the context is lots of players are hurt. But I thought he was maybe the 10th guy when the team was fully healthy. I thought he was going to be competing with like, I don't know, Jalen Wells for minutes. I thought about the 10th guy, maybe 11th, maybe 12th. But I think a usable, rosterable NBA player who's still developing. I think this year he's been pretty good on defense. Also, he is statistically the Grizzlies' best rebounder so far this year. He leads the team in rebound percentage, meaning he grabs the most available rebounds of any player so far. If you like more basic stats, he's second on the team in total rebounds. But you're playing the guy the second most minutes, which means you sort of like what he's doing compared to other players. But you're also saying we don't want to keep him around for $5 million. Also, and maybe this is the bigger point. Maybe I should have led with this. The general tenet for roster building in the NBA is you maintain control of your players and you don't let them walk for nothing. You don't want to get rid of players for nothing. That is a just basic rule of operation for building an NBA team. If you know a guy isn't part of your future plans, you trade him. If your season isn't going great and you're not certain you're going to be able to resign a guy, you trade him. This is why you sent Xavier Tillman away for picks. This is why you traded away Steven Adams. This is why people were outraged you didn't trade Tyreek Evans back in the day. That's why you traded away Courtney Lee back in the day. It's very basic order of operations. It's why you trade away franchise legends when your team isn't going anywhere. You restock the cupboard by sending Mike Conley to the Jazz in a move that basically jump-started the last five years of good basketball. Like Last year not included, of course. It's why you traded away Mark Gasol, even though it was painful. The basic rule is you try to get something for all your guys. Like even Dylan Brooks, you did a sign-in trade. Maybe they'll sign and trade Jake LaRavia. But like the sign and trade for Dylan Brooks brought back almost nothing. So the general rule is you don't let a guy leave for nothing. You have now, by declining Jake LaRavia's option, you have made him a worse trade option. You've lowered his trade value. If a team's really encouraged by what Jake LaRavia is doing this year, they would want him under team control for as long as possible. Having a guy under contract for next year at a reasonable rate and then have his restricted free agent rights after that is much more valuable than trading for a guy who's going to be an unrestricted free agent. So they've damaged Jake LaRavia's trade value by doing this. They've also reduced the odds of keeping him. So all that makes it a little bit strange. Like another example, by the way, of like why it's important to maintain your salaries. You think back to the most important pick in Grizzlies franchise history. You might say the most important pick in Grizzlies franchise history is Ja Morant because he's the best player the franchise has ever had. Okay, I hear you there. But the most important pick in Grizzlies franchise history, in my mind, is Sharif Abdul-Rahim because you got five years out of Sharif Abdul-Rahim, then you traded him for Pau Gasol. Then you traded Pau Gasol for Mark Gasol. Then you traded Mark Gasol for Jonas Valanciunas. Then you trade Jonas Valanciunas for Steven Adams. By not letting those guys leave for nothing, you got 29 years of starting uh, near all-star level play. 29 years of starting front court play from those guys, and that doesn't even include the picks that were involved in some of these things. That doesn't include the fact that you got Vince Williams Jr. 
You got Vince Williams Jr. out of the Steven Adams, Jonas Valanciunas trade. So we still have a guy on the roster that you can directly trace the lineage to Sharif Adur Rahim being drafted in 1995. So you don't let guys go for nothing generally. And now the odds of keeping Jake, if he's any good, you've lowered that. You've also lowered his trade value. So because of all that, it's kind of weird. Now the reason, if you're going to say why you turn this down, you're probably thinking, oh, it has to do with salaries and the luxury tax next year. And yeah, sure. Okay, it does. I mean, maybe they've also decided, hey, listen, Jake LeBrave is not that good. Fair argument. I'm not clamoring for him to be a starter. I'm not clamoring him for being in my top eight. But he's been promising. But then you look towards next year and you look towards the salaries. And so let's talk about the salaries for next season. Right now you have 12 guys that have guaranteed contracts for next year. You have the guys making a little bit more, which are your important players, your John ja Morantz, Desmond Bain, Jaron Jackson Jr., Marcus Smart, Brandon Clark, John Conchar. Those are your basically your non-minimum guys. And then you have the rookies from this year, Zach Eady. I mean, he's not on a minimum, but the rookies from this year, Zach Eady and Jalen Wells. That's eight players. And then you have the four guys, the super cheap guys, the two-way players you promoted. You got Vince Williams Jr., Gigi Jackson, Scotty Pippen Jr., Jay Huff. That's 12 players on guaranteed deals for next year. Those salaries add up to $162 million. That puts you over the salary cap, which is $155 million for next year, but that has you about $25 million away from the luxury tax. The luxury tax line is the line that matters. That's the thing that teams stay away from. Operating over the cap is what everybody does usually. So the Grizzlies would be $25 million away from the luxury tax line, and they still have a restricted free agent decision with Santi Aldama. Now, did Santi Aldama's strong first five games, did that affect this decision? By the way, I guess I could have said that Santi Aldama uh, played really well against the Bucks. He had 19 points and nine rebounds. I guess I could have given you his stats earlier in this show. But Santi Aldama has played so well, you're thinking, oh, okay, we, we probably want to keep that guy. So you say we have 12 players, we're $25 million away from the luxury tax line. What if next year we sign Santi to a contract starting at $15 million per year, and then we draft a guy uh, in the first round next year? So that's your 13th and 14th players. Now we're about, oh, I don't know, $8 million away from the luxury tax line. That, honestly, spoiler that's probably what's going to happen. That's the most likely path next year. Retain Santi Yildama, draft a guy. I mean, maybe keep Luke Kennard again, and that's your 15th player, and you're right up against the luxury tax. Maybe they do that. Could they have kept Jake LaRavia and do those things? If you keep Jake LaRavia, all right, now you're $20 million away from the luxury tax line. You're probably going to draft a guy with your first-round pick, and you want to keep Santi Yildama. That would be your full 15-man roster. They wanted more flexibility. I don't blame them at all for wanting more flexibility. I'm not even like, I'm not even super opposed to declining the option. I just think it's a little odd with how much you've played him this year. And it seems like the thing to do is pick up the option. And then if you decide you want that flexibility at the trade deadline, trade him. I don't think you'd have a problem getting rid of him. I don't think you'd have to attach picks to get rid of him. But they decided, again, flexibility is more important. And of course, dodging the luxury tax, no matter what, is more important. I mean, right now, they are $33 million from the first apron with all the guys they already have under contract. And they can still, I mean, maybe move John Conchar's salary. I mean, good luck with that. They can move Brandon Clark, Although Brandon Clark's been looking more spry. I like that. They could move Marcus Smart. Again, good luck with that. But that is my best analysis for, I mean, why they moved him, as they said, as they told at least Drew Hill. Roster flexibility, the specifics of that roster flexibility, now you have 12 guys under contract plus restricted free agent Santi Aldama, and you're now going to be about $25 million away from the luxury tax line. They wanted that. I just think it's strange to turn down a guy making, I would call it market value, 
and lose the team control over that player. Typically, you don't want to lose team control of guys. Anyways, uh, I think that's the full episode. I don't think there's anything else we need to go over. Again, Colin Castleton, newest Grizzlies player, signed to that two-way spot, and then the Grizzlies are back at it on Saturday against the 76ers. Anyways, if you want to support this show, uh, you can do that at patreon.com slash fastbreakbreakfast. Also, if you still want to sign up for League Pass and haven't yet, uh, use the link in this episode's description. That's an easy way to support this program. Anyways, hope you'll have a great weekend. I'll talk to you soon. Go Grizz!